All right, so we're looking at a calm faith versus the two forms of blind conformity. And I'll say more about them below, but I'm calling them humble blind conformity and um, arrogant blind conformity. So let's see. Um, I have here before proceeding to other topics, which is, you know, for later at another time, we might talk about repentance or um, emotions and health and just any variety of things. But a, a foundation point is this distinction, a calm faith and then two different forms of blind conformity. So when a child's first learning to speak, they mimic the sounds that they hear. We see a little, I think it's a little girl copying an M there in the image. The child may learn that other people keep calling them Alexandria and saying to them, your name is Alexandria. Your name is Alexandria. However, that series of sounds is so complicated, so long, it's so challenging to pronounce. So the child simplifies the sounds to Lex. So first there's blind conformity, like they're just mimicking sounds they hear, copying the sequence of sounds, Alexandria. And then there's a variation to take the long name, Alexandria, and shorten it to Lex. It's natural, it's efficient, it's great, right? That's what kids do. That's what people do. So if someone asks young Lex how to write the letter X, Lex may have no idea what they mean or may have a general vague idea or may even be totally certain and confident. They may totally know how to write an X. Now, what if Lex argues with them? Imagine Lex arguing with somebody about the shape of the letter X. So here she is. This is a different image. Obviously, she's using A's there and her finger painting, but let's say she says, no, that's an X. You see that? You do the two lines like that, and the one line in between them, that's an X. And let's say she argues with somebody. So we're getting into, she could be arguing calm, but we're starting to get into the idea that she might not be calm. Maybe she's kidding. Maybe she knows it's not an X. Maybe she's trying to trick her three-year-old little brother. I don't know. So. Alexandria, she's four or whatever, she says, don't be silly. Everyone knows that a letter is only valid as an X if it meets the following 10 very strict rules. First, a diagonal line that's perpendicular will cross at the midpoint of whatever. And she goes on and, and talks in our 10th grade level terminology, which is, of course, unrealistic for a four-year-old. But that's part of my joke there. And uh, then there's a picture of a clock. Why argue? Why is the shape of an X so important to Lex? Why is agreement with others so important? Does Lex get upset if someone says that the X shape is a numeric code for 10? Like the number that comes after 9, like on a big clock with Roman numerals, we've got the X up there in the upper left. We say 10 o'clock and Lex says no, that's X o'clock. A calm faith arises when the following two things are both present. Certainty, which is just a lot of familiarity, plus courage. Courage like no disturbance about other people and their conformity or non-conformity, their agreement or disagreement. If other people agree, fine. If they don't, fine. I'm calling that courage. I could call it something else, but I'm calling it courage. So one who has calm faith would have both certainty and courage. That's what I mean by faith, and that's what I mean by calm. It doesn't necessarily mean they wouldn't ever be loud or wouldn't ever voice their passion, but there's a foundation of calm faith. So one who's easily disturbed may be accurate about some detail, even certain. They may not be accurate, but... If they're easily disturbed, that's, that's independent of, uh, that's not calm, I guess is the short version, right? Their disturbance is not faith, it's not calm, uh, even if they're right. They're sincere, they could be accurate, but are they calm? Are they relaxed? So if there's a disturbance, then that disturbance, I'm calling it, um, you know, we get into the biochemistry of it later, but that disturbance is insecurity. It's probably like 
um, cortisol and adrenal, uh, adrenaline. But from a psychological, psychological point of view, we could say it's insecurity or doubt or panic. So their disturbance is distinct from calm. So does Lex have a tantrum about the idiots who keep insisting that the X on the clock is a 10? How defensive is Lex about the idea that X is only a letter? Is, is Lex open to the idea that X could be a symbol for 10? Is she defensive? Is she attacking people? Is she, you know, how is she dealing with that? That um, uh, ambiguity, right? So what we're talking about here is X has ambiguity. It could mean the letter between Y and uh, whatever, V. It could mean uh, the, a representation of the number 10. There's also, it's, it could mean that's the point on the map where, you know, our destination is. There's lots of things that X could mean. It, couldn't, it doesn't have to be a letter in a word, right? It could just be a mark, an X mark. Um, so, Lex goes through distinct stages in regard to the letter X. Required is the first stage of total ignorance. We don't know what an X is. Next, another required stage is repeated exposure to the pattern. If she's not creating X, then she's, you know, going to see it secondhand, repeated exposure to a pattern so that the pattern is recognizable to Lex. She'll learn to name it. That thing, that crossing shape of those two lines, that's called an X. Uh, so there's copying and blind conformity then. There can also be validation or correction from others. Um, and, and people's validation and correction can be inaccurate. Uh, it's another little potential source of confusion. Uh, you know, there's ambiguity in life. When we're talking about symbolic codes like language and like um, numbers and shapes and all that, when, they're, when it's symbolic, that means there's ambiguity inherent in it. There's always the possibility for a code to be interpreted in two different ways. That's why it's called a code. So Lex may begin to experiment and refine things like pushing the boundaries. Is it still an X if you put a greater than sign and a less than sign together? If you guys are looking at the uh, blog, you can see what I'm talking about. And the letter 8, I'm sorry, the number 8, it's kind of like an X, a little bit. It's got a little bit of an X that's curvy and it connects at the top and bottom. Is that an X? If, if Lex points to that and says, look, teacher, it's another X. It's a curvy X. Well, that's close, right? It's not exactly right. And some other classmate of hers or, you know, someone might correct her and say, that's an eight. Silly. That's not an X. So we're going to get into uh, the other kinds of blind conformity here soon. Lex may begin, under the picture of the little girl standing there uh, with her hands on her hips and looking up at us, soon Lex may be ridiculing others for calling the X on the clock a 10. Lex may say, look, it is nearly X o'clock, not 10 o'clock, can't you even read? So there might be some um, symbolic system where that X is a 10. But Lex doesn't know it, and she's still defending her old familiar thing. She's a uh, defender of the faith. That's not calm faith. That's getting into arrogant blind conformity. That's defending the faith. That's not faith. Uh, so the initial humility of Lex's blind conformity may shift toward paranoia. Uh, which is an un, I'm calling an unmet desire for others to agree to agree with ideas that are familiar to Lex, rather than face things that, uh, rather than face Lex with potentially disorienting transition of learning new things. So there can be blind conformity and behavior layered over the inner experience of doubt, panic, and disturbance. Let me let me slow down here. So there's that initial humility of Lex's blind conformity. So she's asking people for input. 
she's playful, she's experimenting. She might be a little bit like perfectionist where she doesn't want to get it wrong and she's really nervous. And that's that's an interesting possibility, but even if she's nervous, then there's a degree of humility, right? So that initial humility could shift in toward um, paranoia where where Lex wants to avoid a disagreement with other people, but at the same time as wanting to avoid a disagreement, it's kind of like she's on the lookout to create one. Does that make sense? So there can be that disturbance, doubt, panic in the background. Um, and then we have the picture of the little blonde girl now pointing her finger up in anger. What do you mean that this X is not an X at all, but is a multiplication sign? No. There's no such thing as a multiplication sign. If there was, I would have heard of it by now. My mom would have told me I would know if there was a multiplication sign. So you're just a big poop head because obviously that X can't be a multiplication side because there's no such thing because there shouldn't be because if there was then I would know. So you kind of get how people string together rationalizations and logic to defend uh, what I'm calling an arrogant blind, blind conformity. So uh, Lex's fear can extend into terror, arrogant terror, blame, contempt, rage, all kinds of disturbance, all kinds of fight or flight um, responses. It's a fight response emotionally, and there can be some flight in there as well, but a lot of what we're talking about here is the fight response, the attack response. The possibility that terrifies Lex is that Lex may still have some learning to do. And if Lex feels trapped, that terror, if she feels cornered, then that terror will not result in her withdrawing. It will result in her attacking. And she might attack the people who are not a threat. You know, she might be overzealous. Um, but her experience of terror, if she feels cornered and if she feels terror, then the natural res next thing would be a fight response. You got all that adrenaline. You got all that cortisol, but you can't run because someone feels stuck or trapped, then they fight. My wife and I were talking last night about the idea of being stuck and feeling stuck. And um, ultimately, I didn't know that we were going to get to this, but ultimately, um, as she and I were talking, I suggested that being stuck and being stubborn have a lot in common. So... And I really had never thought of this before in those words. But if someone says, I'm stuck, and then they defend it, and they take energy in defending it, that could be a lot like stubbornness, right? Um, that probably means that there's some fear in the background. There's, you know, there's whatever background there is. Uh, but um, being stuck is an interesting choice of words. The reality is that people keep the same circumstance until they change it or until it um, evolves on its own and that's the bottom line. So things change. It's kind of a foundational point of Buddhism and other systems of uh, emotional mastery um, that things change. So some things change if we want them to stay the same, sometimes things get better without us doing anything. Sometimes things get what we would call worse. Even if we um, are doing good things, we may slow down the the uh, change, but things can change. Like the bottom line is things do change. They can change. They will change. I'll change. You'll change. We'll all change. Ice cream. Something like that. So, Lex may still have some warning to do, and Lex may be very terrified that other people notice that she may have some learning to do. Why isn't that exciting and intriguing to Lex? Well, to the idea of learning more. It could be exciting and intriguing, like a lot of little kids and a lot of people find the idea, the possibility of learning to be interesting. If it's not exciting and intriguing, maybe it's too exciting. 
Maybe Lex is afraid of admitting to confusion, and she doesn't want the public, you know, maybe she's shy. Maybe she doesn't want the public um, attention where other people are challenging her or questioning her or um, saying, you know, you seem to be mistaking X for a multiplication sign. A multiplication sign looks a lot like X, but it's not the letter X. It's, it's actually a different thing. That's why we call it multiplication sign, and over there we call it the letter X, because they're not the same. And then that's the Roman numeral 10. It's not the Roman numeral X. That is the Roman numeral 10. That's how the Romans write 10, as a numeral. So we get all these little details. So Lex may find all that overwhelming. She's like, screw this. I'm going to stick to coloring ponies. You guys can go, you know, do your third grade level stuff or your college level stuff by yourself. I'm going to go color some ponies. Because I've got a really cool coloring book with my little pony and my favorite uh, Little Mermaid and all my favorite Disney characters. And you guys, you guys suck at coloring. I'm leaving. Bye. And she goes and says, you know, I'm going to take my ball and go home, and I'm not going to play with you guys anymore. So Lex could be afraid of admitting to confusion. Instead of admitting confusion, Lex insists on her own comprehension, her own competence, her own fluency, her own superiority, all as a cover to avoid admitting confusion. Many people want to avoid confusion. Many people want to avoid admitting confusion. So this is a background paranoia that a lot of people might have. And it's a normal thing. It's a even a um, valuable thing to be conservative about displaying confusion. It, it might seem immature at times. It might be annoying to a parent that their child does that, but it could also be, you know, it's just what happens sometimes, <laughs> you know? So Lex may even attack any divergence from Lex's familiar version of blind conformity. She may attack it, you know, uh, in a variety of ways. But why does she attack it? Simply because too much uncertainty, too much ambiguity is disorienting to Lex. It's frightening. It's terrifying. It's disturbing. It's disorienting. It's confusing, right? We can, it's kind of become circular in how I'm talking about this. Why does she want to avoid a whole bunch of confusion and ambiguity? Because it's so confusing to her. It's, it makes sense, right? So we can see the humanity in this. All of us at times in our life are going to experience confusion in small ways or in large ways. As children, um, we really don't know the codes that adults are using. We don't know language. We don't know English. We don't know German. We don't know uh, Latin. We don't know any of these languages until we start to hear them. Other people invented them, you know, a thousand years ago or a hundred years ago. And at the age of six months, we start to really get trained in the sounds of a particular language, you know? So here I have a little picture of a girl with a yellow shirt. She looks like she's a little upset, like she's just about to cry, but before she does any crying, she's going to drive off the perceived threat. She's going to yell. She's going to attack. But in the background, we know that she's, fuck, she's extremely terrified. I was going to curse there. She's flipping terrified. So she says, stop disturbing me. I'm still trying to really practice writing and the letter X. And, and you were like totally distracting me with talk of Y and Z and multiplication signs. Shut up. Leave me alone. Let me master X in private. I do not want to openly admit that I'm still learning about X. If you cannot conform blindly to X with me, then we cannot keep each other's company or not without some firm structure and leadership, maybe some moderators, to keep us from freaking out. I'm being seriously. You guys don't understand. I'm trying to get X and how to write it, and you guys keep talking about Y and multiplication signs and Roman numerals. I, nah, let me get X. And we can really be sympathetic to little Lex, who wants to be left alone to really develop in, you know, learning everything she needs to learn to be able to write the letter X. If that's what she wants to, to master, great. And it would be a bad teaching method to overwhelm kids with too many letters or too many things 
one of my concerns in talking to people is I want to be sensitive to, as I lay out the various things, how uh, clear are you on the different points I'm making. So I'll give the opportunity for everybody to uh, comment here in a moment. So we want to have things presented in a sequence and in an intensity that works. So it's valuable to everyone or, you know, to most of the people. And then other people can be, you know, uh, catch up a little bit in a side conversation. But um, <clears throat> we can understand people's experience of being overwhelmed, of, of they want to reduce ambiguity. They want to just know really clean, clear, simple uh, let me practice this I, until I get this. I don't want anything else. We can relate to that. If I'm practicing guitar, I'm a guitarist. If I'm practicing guitar and I want to really learn something, you can't give me 20 songs to learn if they're all way out of my skill range. You've got to give me one song that's close to my skill range. Let me work on it. Maybe you give me two or whatever, but don't give me 20. That's too much for a, a, a beginning guitarist. That's ridiculous. You give people, you know, chunks that they can handle uh, that are a good fit for where they're at and where their interests are. So, Lex, who's now turned to this arrogant form of blind conformity where she's attacking people who aren't, um, who are going beyond, you know, the lines of her coloring book. So she's got what's familiar to her. She wants everybody to stay within these lines. And if anybody goes out of those lines, it's a problem for her. And we can, we can relate to that. Okay. Um, so Lex wants, Lex may want the presence of authority, but Lex is not ready to provide that. All Lex can do is attempt to exclude alternatives. Um, so instead of, you know, if she's got, if the teacher says you need to learn these 20 songs, the Lex, Lex can basically rip up 15 of them or throw them away or just stick them in the drawer and, you know, just ignore what the teacher said because it's too much. She's got to start with small chunks. So Lex may be confused. Lex may face ambiguity. She may be overwhelmed. She may be terrified, whatever things. She may get quite frustrated, emotional, antagonistic, and upset. She may kind of have this hysterical commentary about different symbolic systems. So X in Roman numerals is 10. X in letters is the thing between um, V and Y. How can X be 10? 10 is 10 and X is only X. So the idea that one thing can be two things or can symbolize two things, that's tricky. X squared equals um, 9. So what's X? Somebody can answer with their voice x squared equals 9, so what's x? Three. Okay. Or, what else? Three. Three or what? Minus 3. Or, or negative 3 or minus 3, one, right. One, one. What's that? 1, 1, 1. 1, 1, 1, okay. No, it'd be negative 3. Yeah, I got your negative 3 answer, Daniel. That's what I was, was hoping that somebody would notice, that in addition to positive 3, there are negative numbers, but is a four-year-old going to know that? Probably not. So if I say x squared equals 9 and there's two answers, that's confusing to some people. But that's, the, that's how it is in math is that there's, you know, negative 3 and 3 can be, you know, the variable x. So X can be a letter, it can be a Roman numeral, it can be a mathematical variable, it can be a sign on the map, like a, a symbol on the map for our destination. X marks the spot for a treasure, for we put a, an X on somebody's, uh, you know, if you're like um, a designer, a clothes designer, I forget what that's called, a seamstress or whatever, where you're like preparing somebody's special wedding gown or their tailored suit, what do you call that, a tuxedo, and you put a little X, a little tiny X in chalk because that's where you want to put your seam or where you want to put your pin or I don't know what. You're just marking with an X. It's not a letter. It's a mark. Um, actually, in construction, we do that. You know, you mark with an X. Why? Because that's where you drive the nail or that's whatever. It's just a mark. So X is, I picked X 
because it's a Roman numeral, because it's such an easy letter to write, and because it's used for so many other purposes. That's why I picked it for this article. So Lex may get hysterical. She may get aggressive. She may insist that the Romans and their freaking Roman numerals are myths. I don't even think that Romans are real. I heard that they're myths. They're not valid anyway, even if they are, they're just not valid. They're evil. They're just, they're distracting. And they're probably just a fictional civilization that never even existed because it obviously should not have ever existed. And it's a threat to the sanctity of our holy alphabet, which is uh, only in the uh, Arial font or the Times New Roman. Not that Times New Roman has anything to do with the Romans because they never existed or they shouldn't have. Anyway, it's a shameful historical anomaly in the history of human language and human civilization that these Romans ever existed to confuse me because I don't like to be confused and they suck. And that is the kind of thing that humans do sometimes. And when, when somebody displays that, it's a repulsive um, energy and it can be very strong and it's worth being, uh, it's worth noticing that and being like sensitive to that. So if my wife or my three-year-old is very, you know, intense in some response to me, then I may think, okay, there's too much ambiguity here for them. We need to remove some of the choices. It's like if you have a four-year-old and you're saying, get dressed for school, that can be too much choice. You may need to say, okay, pick what pants you're going to wear. These or these. Those are your two choices. That's it. This one or that one. Pick. And if they don't choose, you choose for them. But you don't give them too big of a, of a ambiguity or too big of a choice process. It's, it's too complicated for them. So we can notice people when they're, you know, having a fit, when they're upset, we can withdraw the immediate issue, we can start to provide structure, we can start, start to provide simplicity, remove complexity, just overall relax everything. Those are normal human processes, whether it's parenting or uh, managing employees or interacting with clients. I had a prospect over here today and he started talking about, uh, um, I'll just say, um, hmm, how do I want to put this, um, apocalyptic Christian topics, which he finds uh, very um, convincing. And I just kind of, you know, nodded my head and encouraged him a little bit, but <laughs> let him talk and then we, we moved on. Um, you know, he wasn't like asking what was my opinion, and he wasn't asking um, it f for new information on the subject. He had a sense of enough familiarity that he was, you know, uh, satisfied with his conclusions on the subject. I was clear he didn't he didn't want to explore the subject with me necessarily. You know, so. Uh, the last picture in these pictures is the little girl with her fist raised up, little red-haired girl. Lex's blind conformity may stop being humble. Instead of, you know, just saying, yeah, I'm copying what's in the, the book, you know. Here's the little book. I'm tracing the outline. I'm copying it. That's what my mom told me to do. What about it? Yeah, I, did, I think I did pretty good. So she may go from that stage of humility and become rigid. She might get terrified, frightened, arrogant, uh, antagonistic, etc. Again, uh, as it relates to her accuracy, Lex may even be right about some point, at least partially right. But if Lex is arguing passionately about what is the real shape of X and what is not the real shape of X, if Lex is upset about the topic to the point of distress, even aggression, then that is what I'm calling terror and panic, not a calm faith. Very strong contrast to a calm faith. I can be calm and humble where I'm not certain. I'm just like, well, I don't know about that topic, or um, I do know about that topic, but I'm not totally certain. That's still calm. It, it, it's not necessarily faith in, in the sense of, you know, Confidence, I don't know if you guys know, but fidelity 
and confidence have the same word origin as faith. Um, so anyway, hysterical arguing, which, you know, kids may do, adults may do, it's the pretense of faith. It's the pretense of confidence, as if I'm an expert on the subject, I might erupt into hysterical arguing. There's not only my familiarity with the subject, but that background issue of my biochemistry, how calm am I, have I had enough saturated fats in my cell walls, am I, you know, raging with hormones of, uh, from women's monthly hormones to cortisol to adrenaline to whatever, I don't know if uh, it's quite possible that in the monthly cycle that an adult woman have, would have, that cortisol and adrenaline are, are some of the hormones that are fluctuating. I, I've never studied that. But um, different people have different amounts of sensitivity or reactivity at different times. And when I, I remember I was in the, a delivery room with the pregnant woman uh, in the delivery room, and she was, she had a lot of hormones going. And she was so um, courageous and with her grandmother, her grandmother was like this really um, <laughs> domineering personality. And that young lady, she was, I don't know, she was like 17 in the delivery room. Um, she was very powerful. And she was like, back off, Grandma. The nurses can handle this. I'm going to make my choice here. And I don't, you know, I don't need an epidural anesthesia or whatever it was. I don't know if you guys already know what I'm talking about. But she, she made some comment where she was telling her grandmother to, you know, uh, relax, basically. She was like, back off, Grandma. Relax. My mom's here. You're here. I'm so glad you're here. And the nurses and blah, 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 they're here. They can handle this. They don't need your, you know, I, you know, I, when we, when I want your input, I'll let you know, but like you're, you know, the grandma was kind of, you know, freaking out literally. And the daughter, the granddaughter is the one who put the grandma in her place. And I was surprised because like that young lady was, is, is normally very shy, especially in regard to her grandmother. Um, <coughs> as I said, her grandmother is pretty, overbearing now. Her grandmother's changed since then. That was like 10 years ago. But anyway, um, so being a great grandma can change you. Being a grandma can change you. I think being a parent can change you too. Okay, let's move on. So Lex is, if Lex is hysterically arguing, then she's not ripe for proceeding yet. And she might never be ripe for proceeding into a particular subject. That's fine. Those with a calm faith no blind conformity, conformity when it's displayed. They know humble blind conformity, and they know arrogant blind conformity. There's nothing wrong with blind conformity. It's just not a calm faith. And there is something valuable about a calm faith. It can be really useful and efficient and powerful to have a foundation of a calm faith as distinct from blind conformity because blind conformity means I don't really know, I'm not really competent I don't really know how things fit together very well. Maybe I can write the letter X, but can I pronounce the word Alexandria? Do I know it's a place in Egypt? Is that important? I don't know. So as we get older, our intelligence develops. A little kid isn't going to be intelligent in terms of being able to make connections that a 20-year-old or a 40-year-old might make. You know, a 3-year-old is not going to get those references. So someone with calm faith will know blind conformity. They'll respect a humble blind conformity, and they can respect an arrogant blind conformity. They will definitely interact differently with the two. They know respect. They know curiosity. They know a sense of humor, a sense of humility. And they also know the absence of all of those things, the relative presence or absence of all of those contrasting things. So um, I was recording. I am recording the uh, talk here. If anybody wants to comment or question while I'm recording, Go ahead now. All right, thank you. I'm going to turn off the recording.